Hey everyone, welcome to the channel. My name is Luke with Canadian Path Assistant. I'm here bringing you some tips and insights about the pathologist assistant profession. Let's jump into it. So this video was released just over about a week ago in a virtual open house and it shares a lot of good info about the Eastern Virginia Medical School or the EVMS PA program. And, uh, and I think that's actually quite beneficial. Unfortunately, only about 25 people were in attendance. Almost no one has watched it online it's about an hour and 30 minutes plus long which is uh, which is pretty heavy <laughs> to work through so i just want to give you a quick summary of of kind of what they what they hit on so first of all they start with a quick overview of the pa programs actually in the us the evms program is the third largest in the states this uh, for the for the upcoming year so 2021 they'll be taking 23 students and they're receiving about 130 to 150 applicants a year. So that's a, you know, a fairly big pool to be drawing from. Then they kind of briefly cover sort of who should be applying to this program or what, what sort of qualities are making a good applicant. And they start off touching on, you know, you have to know that you're getting into autopsies and surgical grossing. You're going to be in the lab, so things are going to be orderly. There are a bunch of standards that you're going to have to follow. You will be working alongside pathologists, medical examiners, surgeons, that, uh, that shouldn't be unexpected. And the majority of the work is going to be hands-on work, as hopefully we know already by now. They next touch on some application and admission requirements, and I think these are pretty important because these vary a fair bit from school to school. So the first thing that they touch on is the need to write a personal statement or an essay. And this is where they're looking for basically your dying desire and need of why you want to be a PA. Tell them that. They also want to make sure that you actually know and understand what a PA does and what the profession is actually about. Now their stated GPA minimum on their website is a bachelor's degree with a 3.0 minimum. And that is a cumulative total, not your last two years, so your whole bachelor's degree. They do not specify a science specific degree, but they have a bunch of course prerequisites that they are looking for in there. And they also stated in that video that although a 3.0 GPA is their minimum cutoff, they are actually looking at probably 3.2 to 3.3 GPA to actually be a, a competitive applicant. So below 3.2, they're, they're probably not gonna consider your application very strongly unless you have a bunch of other things sort of bringing up, bringing up uh, you know your application they want three letters of recommendation from faculty from previous uh, prerequisite courses so things like anatomy or chemistry they actually want a recommendation from that faculty for anyone who is either a few years from school or is not directly in touch with any of those professors they stated that uh, that you ac you can go back to the faculty and actually just have them rate your performance on a historical standard so if you took anatomy in 2015 and you don't know anyone in the faculty they can just pull up the records and say you know 15 percent of students got an a in anatomy if you got an a in anatomy then you're in that top 15 percent they said that would be perfectly acceptable for that next they are looking at shadowing experience so this is currently a mandatory requirement for their application uh, despite the current situation with COVID, they are soldiering on with that and they are actually looking for about a week's worth of shadowing that covers uh, surgicals, autopsies and frozens in some way, shape or form. Now, if you had only four days as opposed to five, I think that would be fine, but they're really looking to make sure that all of the applicants that they have actually know what they're getting into. They don't want to be in a position where someone's two months in, six months in and goes, Ugh, I didn't really know what I was getting into. So that is the reasoning behind that. Uh, of course, they want to see a resume or some kind of CV with any kind of um, beneficial work experience. Things like teaching a prerequisite course, if you worked in a lab setting of some kind uh, alongside a pathologist, also those would be beneficial. They have an online application fee of $125. That's pretty standard. And they are also looking for a GRE or an MCAT score to come along with that. Now, they said these exam scores, they're not looking for anyone to, you know, skyrocket uh, in the top 95th percentile. They said average scores are totally fine. They spent a lot more time looking at the, the GRE and they said, again, average scores are, would be fine. The only time they'd probably 
you know, push an applicant out is if their GRE scores are in the single digits. So something to be aware of there. And if you are applying with an MCAT instead of GRE, one of the things just to be aware of is they will probably ask you along the way, okay, you took the MCAT, how come you're not applying to medical school? So just be ready for that question if that is you. Then if you have all those minimum criteria, they will move you along to a panel interview with six or seven people. They said it would be about an hour long, uh, 45 minutes approximately for the interview with a short tour, which may end up being a virtual tour uh, in these COVID times. And they said they would start interviewing applicants January, probably mid-January 2021 and continue all the way through August. So they don't have a firm application end point. Like they're not gonna say, okay, after February, no more applications. It sounds like they are just going to be taking applications until they fill their class and they anticipated early August probably being that point in time when they are fill their class. And then they said they are keeping four to five people on a wait list and that is not to be unexpected. So if anyone drops out, you might be able to, to sneak in. The next thing that they're looking at are the course prerequisites themselves. So again, they didn't look for a science specific degree. They just wanted a minimum GPA with a bunch of required courses. And those required courses are two semesters of biology. They didn't specify a particular course, but just general biology. Those need to have a lab component, two semesters of general chemistry with a lab, uh, two semesters of organic chemistry with a lab, or you could take a semester of organic chemistry. So one semester with a lab and then one semester of biochemistry. They consider those about equal weight. And, and they just stated because you're not actually doing super hard chemistry type things in the course, but, but courses like organic chemistry are a good sort of marker for if you can handle a course that rigorous, you'll probably be in a good spot for the program itself. Additionally, they want a semester of math, so one semester and one semester of physics as well. Now, those are the prerequisites, so if you don't have those, they're probably not going to take your application. But they also had some recommended courses, and that was one term of microbiology, one term of combined anatomy and physiology, one term of neuroanatomy, and one term of histology. Now, they stated these as required courses, uh, sorry, not required courses. These are not required, but recommended. So if you are an individual whose GPA is a little bit lower, maybe it's you know 3.1, 3.2, definitely on the bottom end of that spectrum. These are courses that may, may sort of bring your application back up and give them reason to think, okay, this, even though their overall GPA is not as great, They've taken these courses, and especially if you do well in those courses, they, uh, you know, they may bring your application back into consideration. One last mention about those courses, the, the recommended ones, you have to do well in them, especially if the rest of your GPA isn't doing as well. They mentioned that if your GPA is less than 3.2 in those specific courses, it's, it's not gonna help your case. The next thing they touched on was their actual program format. So again, it's a two year master's degree program and the program is administered over six semesters. They stated a fall, a spring and a summer. The fall term ends about December 10th and then you get about a month long break until mid January before the spring term starts up again. Uh, I say spring because in Canada, <laughs> January hit cold. Um, that's not spring, but for them, sure. Then from spring to summer, there's not really a break uh, at all in between there. And their summer term, in case you're thinking of a, a shorter semester, their summer term is actually 12 weeks long, which they consider beneficial because it means you get a longer period of time to complete the required coursework instead of cramming it all in to a small spot. Most courses are going to be held online, but any courses that do have a lab component, those lab components will still be hosted in person at the school. And that is a recent change to partially account for COVID, I'm assuming, and everything's probably moving online. So I wouldn't be surprised to see that carry on once COVID ends. This is just a quick screenshot of their curriculum from the first year. And as you can see, there's a bunch of different courses they have listed here and broken up into the, into the fall, spring and summer. For year two, they have it set up for all your clinical courses to be, or clinical rotations to be occurring here. They 
approximate about 1500 hours total of clinical experience in their second year broke up between various clerkship sites. The, the clinical year also has a bunch of online courses that you're still expected to do so those you can see here in this screenshot from their second year curriculum and these are expected to be taken place during the evenings or weekends kind of when you have a spare chance and aren't at the hospital. They also included that by the end of your second year, so by the end of your clinical rotation, you'll be presenting a case in a, in a seminar type setting, and that's going to be kind of a final project for you. They also stated that graduates from their program have a 100% ACP pass rate for their certification board exam on their first right attempt. So they are doing something right. Now they had a brief spot in the middle where they talked about a histotech program that they also have. I'm going to breeze by that largely except to say they mentioned that an individual with a weaker initial application to their Path A program could use this one year histotech program to try and bolster their application and make them a more competitive applicant for the next year. Now kind of like those recommended courses we talked about earlier, they are looking for you to do well in this histotech program and well by their standards is a 3.5 GPA or above. And if you do go that route, you can use some of your credits from the histotech program to apply to the Path A program. They didn't indicate whether or not that would just reduce your course load for the Path A program or your overall tuition, but something to consider if you go that route. The next thing they touched on was a bunch of information about their clinical sites. So their clinical rotations, there are several kind of core or mandatory, mandatory sites that they're sending students through. And those are largely on the kind of eastern to sort of middle central portion of the US, while there are some elective sites that are as far west as Washington and California. They one thing that they mentioned that no other school other than them does is for the uh, for the core clinical locations or clerkships that are located along the east. They actually are paying for your lodging if you are traveling sort of out of state or far away. So I think that is a pretty cool thing that they do. But they're not going to pay for lodging for any of the optional clerkships. So if you decide, oh, California suite, go in there, uh, they're not going to pay for your lodging there. That's out of your own pocket. Currently, their forensic or ME rotation is suspended because of COVID, but they're hoping slash expecting that comes back in 2021 in the spring sometime. Between the medical examiners and hospital autopsy cases, they estimate that you'll do somewhere between 150 to 200 autopsies, or at least be exposed to that many. And on the surgical grossing frozens, the, the laboratory experience, overall, they estimate about 1,500 plus hours of practical experience. You will be evaluated sort of midway through your clinical rotations and again at the end. And as part of that, you will also be creating an activity log for yourself. So by the time you're done, you can take that to an employer and say, these are all the things that I have grossed on and worked on and done please hire me. They also mentioned that their rotations are running for anywhere between eight to 16 weeks. They don't want to send you to a location and then bounce you out two weeks later. That's pretty disruptive. So you'll be able to stay in, in one spot at least for long enough to, to get settled and get into a groove of things. And then the last thing they mentioned about the clerkships or their practical rotations is that your final clerkship cannot be at a location in which you are hoping to get a job. So protect prospective students cannot be hoping to get a job from that last location. It has some implications with NACL's accreditation and in their rules, so just something to be aware of. Then they touched on a, a quick overview of some specimens you can expect to see. I think they just threw that in there, so if you were watching this lecture and you went, Ooh, gross, a sign that you need to pick a different school or career. <laughs> Then they touched on an overview of where PAs can be working. The vast majority of locations, probably 80 to 90% are at a hospital and will probably be grossing anywhere between five to eight hours a day. And that is kind of the, the overall expectation. The next thing they mentioned were some salary expectations for when you come out of the program. The national average, they stated, 
was 84,000. Again, first year coming out of the program. And I think that takes into account a big range depending on the cost of living and where you're actually working. The range itself, they said, was somewhere between 62 to 124,000. And again, that's American dollars, so something to just be aware of. They then touched on workplace expectations. Again, probably 90% of your time is gonna be spent grossing within most likely a hospital setting. And you're probably going to be working at a site that processes somewhere between 20 to 30,000 specimens a year, so you're not slacking off. Briefly then, they went over why there is an increased demand for PAs, and some of this I, I found pretty interesting as well. First of all, PAs are pretty cost effective compared to a pathologist working in the lab and doing the dissections themselves. We are almost 25% the cost of a pathologist working, so that is a big cost savings, and the vast majority of that cost savings is actually made up within the salary for a PA itself. The baby boomers are kind of aging and retiring and living longer, so that's just more people utilizing the healthcare system and, and potentially getting sick. The U.S. population is continuing to grow, and there is also a reduction in the number of pathologists and pathology residents in training. So as that number goes down, the number of staff available to do grossing is also going to decrease. They mentioned some of the duty evolution of PAs as we become more and more involved in the lab. We're doing more complex dissections. Our volume of work is increasing. There are roles in fetal autopsies academic responsibilities increasing, there's more admin duties, and we're kind of getting more and more integrated into the rest of the laboratory as well. They then finished with a brief question and answer period, and one of the first questions was, are older applicants as viable applicants to the program? And I'm guessing that based on what they mentioned earlier, most of their applicants are in their 20s or maybe early 30s, and older, they didn't, again, give an age range, but I'm thinking maybe 35 plus, or they didn't say, but it seemed like they were slightly more hesitant with older applicants, but they said that in their experience, they haven't had any issues with them, but they are probably just looking for more confirmation that an older applicant will succeed compared to a younger person who has just come out of school. They next answered a question about the weight of academics versus experience for their application. And it seemed that even though experience for example, as an on-the-job trained PA is nice. It's not going to make up for a, you know, for a poor academic uh, standing. Even that 3.0 GPA, if you have a lot of work experience, they're probably still going to lean a little bit more towards that 3.2, 3.3 and above for an applicant. So don't count on that as getting your, you know, getting your butt out of the fire. Where to find shadowing experience was the next question that they touched on. Uh, again, the school is requiring shadowing for the program and i know that is a big challenge for some individuals especially given the the covid situation going on right now they stated that they will not facilitate any shadowing so don't call them and expect to just get a shadowing placement they're not doing that the one thing that they did say is for any strong applicants that they have so you know bang on gpa you're you're killing it in every other way you're your statement of intent or whatever is awesome. You have a killer CV, but you haven't managed to get any shadowing. If you basically stand out in every other way except for shadowing, they may may facilitate some shadowing on your behalf. The last question touched on the GRE and MCAT scores. They are wondering what kind of GRE score is too low. Now, personally, I'm not too familiar with GRE scores, so I'm going purely based on what they told me, and it was stated that Again, an average GRE score would probably be sufficient. The only time they might consider ruling out an applicant is if their GRE score was in the single digits or if your MCAT score was totally abysmal. All right, we cruised through that pretty quick. I know it was a lot of information to go over, but hopefully to anyone who is considering applying or has applied and is thinking about the next year of school, hopefully that was useful for you. If you want to watch the full hour and 38 minutes of video, I'm gonna put that link down in the description. You guys can follow it there and get that information for yourself. Otherwise, thanks for tuning in and I will see you guys next time.